looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. And then some churches, sometimes I'll come to the fellowship together and I won't be able to give anything out. I'm not feeling really good. I can't do much. I've had a tough week, but I've come just to worship. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. And I'm doing it while my brothers and sisters in Christ on this journey of life. So there's a difference between just doing all the outward and we miss all the inward here. So keeping the laws without recognizing the real meaning behind what we're supposed to do. And finally, there's comfort in lists. Now, maybe not with you. Some people are hardwired, and I'm speaking more to me. Maybe you're more wired like I am. I like lists. If you went to my computer right now and you lifted my laptop, do you know what I have on my laptop? The first thing you're going to see besides a picture of Carol and our dog is going to be a list of all the things I have to do tomorrow with little exclamation points of what's a priority, what's medium, and what's low priority already for tomorrow, and then how many days I have yet to do all of that. I'm a list guy. I resonate when I go to seminars and conferences when they give me a list. You come to this church, you'll often find a what, everyone? A list. You come to our seminar. I I, I do that. And so now I want to caution you. In fact, I want to move from a caution. I want to warn you. Even though I'm giving these four today, and we will conclude these. The others will go a lot quicker, but let me make back to this. Even though I'm giving you these four, there could be 40 of these. The point of the matter is go deep and don't get so comfortable with a list. Sometimes just throw away the list and just go right back to the word and say, Lord, you are the Lord of the word. You're the living word. And this is the written word. So, son of God, would you take the spirit of God and use the word of God to change the child of God? And just do that. Because list sometimes very, 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 very important. Some people, you're so important with the list that if you didn't get a blank filled in and they missed it on the PowerPoint, oh my goodness, I've missed a list. Don't do that because lists can be very, 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 very deceiving. That's why we don't give you a list of what are the approved movies you can see. What are the approved restaurants at which you can eat? What are the approved seminars that you can go to? We don't want to give you all these lists. We do want to teach you God's word theologically. We may never be a big church, but I pray we are the most sound church in God's word that we can be because we want to feed you accurately. Let me tell you what all this legalism will do. It will breed within us, if we own legalism, what I call a false sense of holiness because if we embrace legalism and we're doing these things, then we can trick ourselves, and I could say Satan can because our heart is desperately wicked, to make us feel more holy because we're doing the list We're doing the legalism, but we've lost an intimacy with God. And so we have to be very, very careful of this. Now, I'll tell you that legalism is so insidious that even in the book of Galatians, let me read this to you, Paul wrote of how dangerous legalism can be. And by the way, in Galatians chapter 3, it's written by Paul, and I think Paul was probably the poster child for legalism because he wasn't just a Pharisee, He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So he was the poster child for legalism. I'm saying that now to say this. He had an instant transformation when he trusted Christ as his Savior. And living out what you're hearing today, that was a transformed life. And he warns against legalism. And the best book for you to know is Galatians. And here's what he says. You foolish Galatians... Or you could say, you foolish believers in legalism, who has tricked you before your eyes, whose eyes were on Jesus Christ, was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want you to find out. Did you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law? In other words, did you get God's Spirit by keeping the law, doing legalism? Or by hearing with faith? And we know that We are not saved by keeping the law. We do not get the spirit by keeping the law. We get saved and we receive the spirit by hearing the word of faith in Jesus Christ and then believing that in our heart before him. So he warned us. The key word there is bewitched you. And why is that a key word? Because I think all of us can be easily tricked into following legalism, which will eventually deaden us. So we need to be careful for that. 
Chuck Swindoll has written some great material. The material that I especially like regarding legalism is coming out of something that Chuck Swindoll, he's a radio teacher, preacher, he grew up in the, the, the world of legalism. And when he became a Christian, based on the truth of God's word, he saw the dangers in the enslavement of legalism. So in order to combat legalism, he then did a study and he came up with three very simple principles of how you can oppose legalism in your life. And parents, I'd like you to really know this. And then I want you to speak with your mate, go through scripture and evaluate how you're working with your kids and then to warn them about legalism. And here's what he said. First of all, truth must be must emerge. Truth must emerge. Let me see if I can make sense out of that. The best way for you to detect legalism is to be sound in God's word so that when legalism, that would be man's way of making and keeping a list to get better connected to God, will be revealed. So you need to know God's word. That's why it's important that you find a Bible teaching church that will teach you scripture as often verse by verse as possible, so that while you're learning about the Christian life, you're really learning it from a biblical point of view, not from three points in a poem and a joke and a dance and drama and all that. Now, I'm not against that, but when you lean on that to do the truth, you're moving away from the solid teaching of God's word. So you want to find a place. My heart still believes that this island needs a solid Bible college and seminary that centers on the teaching of God's word from the languages to verse by verse, systematic theology for the purpose of knowing God's word, not just to know it, because that's dead theology or dead orthodoxy, but to know it so well that you live it so you can then correct it and teach it to others. So truth must emerge. Secondly, convictions must be employed. And I like what Chuck had to say about that because there are many people that know truth, but they don't live the truth with convictions. In other words, you need to know the word, but then you have to be willing to live the word. Do you have your convictions based on scripture or upon some list that you picked up at some seminar? Are you living your life as a mom or dad or businessman or Christian leader based on a list that you got in a class or seminar, workshop, conference? Instead of on, is this really what God's word has to say? Is that point based upon solid exegesis of scripture? So you need to have that conviction based on truth. But then it goes one step further, and I like this, and he ended with this. He said, grace must be embraced. Grace isn't the excuse for not doing God's will. Grace is the excuse to have power to do God's will. How important that really is. So we live by grace. Often you're going to find legalists are those that will want to put you under the law and make you feel unspiritual if you don't do certain things a certain way at a certain time on certain days. So be very careful of that. Well, I think I said enough about legalism, and so that's the first thing. So let me just rapidly go through these. Number two, we must decide to worship. You'll notice in verse 13 of John chapter 5, it says here, But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, and I'll stop there for a moment. I don't know how long the afterward was. Was it later that day? Was it the next day? Was it on Saturday? Was it when? I don't know exactly when. All I know is that the time period was probably not too far apart and he found him in the temple. It wasn't like Jesus was saying, now where did he go? Where did the, the crowd was so big? I lost him in the crowd. Where did he go? I'll go here and check. No, it's not like that so much. It's in other words, he found him. I saw him. There he was. He's in the temple. And when I read that, I thought that's interesting because here is a man who got healed. Now, he could have said, now that I can walk around, let me check out this city. Let me see where the best places are to eat. Maybe I could go find my family and friends. Maybe I could go show them. I don't know. There's a thousand reasons probably, and I know I'm exaggerating, of where he could have gone. But he went to the temple. Now, I can't make a big argument. Did he go there to worship? Did he go there to maybe give back to God because of what he got from Jesus? I don't know any other reasons other than he went to the temple. Other than he could have gone somewhere else, but he went to the temple. So when I look at that, I'm going to kind of lay that aside for just a moment and just build on that. From a more biblical point of view, I believe that one of the greatest ways to have a continual change life, obviously, is not to put yourself back under the law, but it's also to take a moment and really worship the Lord for who He is. Now, I've spent a lot of time mentioning that worship is 24-7. It's something that we do. Worship could be 
washing someone else's car, taking someone else to the doctor. That's an act of service. It's an act of worship because you're doing it as unto the Lord. So that is worship. As much as it is sitting here having a wonderful worship song and zoning out from the world and focusing on Jesus Christ and just saying, Lord, you are worthy. It's just the same, however you do it, as long as Christ is at the center of it. And so I would say that if you want to have a continual change life, let me urge you to have a continual worshipful experience. I know why you're at work. Concentrate a little bit more to say, who am I doing this for? Why am I doing this? Who's going to get the glory out of this? Is there anything I can do to further the Lord? Can I do this life to bring glory and honor to you? Many of you heard me say this. I don't do good works to stay saved. I do good deeds because I am saved. You heard me say that. I've chosen, and I think many of you as well, that when you've trusted Christ as Savior, I want to live a life that says thank you to the Lord by my lifestyle. That's a form of worship to the Lord. He didn't say that he went to a temple service. It's like we don't go to a worship service. We come to worship. And so my question to you is, do you have that time alone with the Lord? Will you really worship him? Number three. Besides, we must reject legalism. We must decide to worship. We also must decide to stop sinning. Some of you are probably having a little bit of a heart attack because I spoke so much on legalism. You might be thinking, okay, that means we don't need to do anything. We're saved and we're under grace and we can live any way we want and all of that. No, because Jesus kind of gives us a little bit of a, of a peekaboo window into this when he said this. After he found him in the temple, he said something to him and notice what he said first all. Behold, you become well, kind of reminding him what's happened now so that he is responding based upon the changed life. Look what God has done for you. You become well. So the reason I live a life is because what God has done in my life. Then it goes on to say, your next step is, is do not sin anymore. In the Greek it says, don't continue sinning. So nothing worse happens to you. Well, basically it says this, that once you've trusted Christ as Savior, it is not, I can go out and live as I please. Oh, you can try to, but you won't, because God will discipline you. I've had a good dad in my life. He was a strong, moral, wonderful man. Not a believer, but he had a good sense of right and wrong. He reminded me of where my boundaries were. He then told me those boundaries. He then explained to me what would happen if I stepped out of those boundaries. When I stepped out of those boundaries, he told me I stepped out of my boundaries. And then he told me how I'd be disciplined the next time I did that. So there was a little bit of grace. And the next time I stepped out of those boundaries, after he told me about them and told me what the discipline would be he always did it he always did it there was such a consistency about dad grace and a consistency of discipline so as i was growing up there was a unique fear of my dad i don't mean like oh here comes dad it was more like i respect dad because he's a man of his word if he says he's going to do this he'll do it. if he says he's not going to do he's not going to do that he's disciplined and you know what the lord is just like that he says don't sin anymore don't continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid that you should live any longer in that sin. I know you're still going to sin, but don't live a life full of sin. And God says, I'll discipline you when you do, but it'll always be done by grace. I think one of the things that we uh, sometimes forget about is the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of sin. You know what would be a great conversation to have with your kids on the way home, parents? Ask them, why is sin so bad? And then after they go through their whole explanation, then ask them, why is it so bad in your life? And let them feel that momentary act of connection to sin, that we choose not to sin, not to stay saved, but because we are saved. And let me go to number four. We'll close with this. Besides rejecting legalism, besides deciding to worship, besides deciding that we we do want to know God's word and we do want to cease from a life of sin, I know we'll never be sinless, but we ought to sin less. We need to also decide to openly confess Jesus Christ. When I read this, I decided to go back to some great, great biblical commentators, and oddly enough, they were all over the map on their explanation. Well, I'm not going to take the time to tell you how all these guys disagreed on it, but I would like to tell you that while there is controversy out there, I'm going to tell you where, I've la- where I'm going to land on this. It says here, the man went away after speaking to Jesus, and where did he go? He went and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. One commentator said, see what he did? He went to go rat out Jesus. He went to go to the Jews and he ratted out Jesus to the Jews here, told them who made him well. I do not buy that, although many commentators believe that. Why? Because if you follow the story of the Jews, they were never upset over Jesus for healing the guy. 
What they were upset over him was that the man got up and walked, and they wanted to know who told you could get up and walk. So it wasn't the healing part. It was the breaking of the law on the Sabbath. And so what did he do? He wanted to go back to the Jews now, this man, and say, here's what Jesus really did. He made me well. And that's really what spiritual thing is all about. Look it. I was once lost, but I'm now found. I am spiritually well. It's not about I'm carrying my mat, I'm going to go do this, I can go there, I can have all this other life. No, it's all about I am a new man in Christ. And he began to openly confess Christ. And I would say at the threat of his own level of persecution because now what he's doing, he's publicly identifying with Christ and what Christ has really done. So again, going back to how can I have a sustained life? I really believe the first thing is watch out for the insidiousness of legalism. Secondly, while you're watching out for legalism, avoiding it at all costs, you want to worship the Lord from the inside out. While you're worshiping the Lord, you also want to deal with the sin that's going to crop up in your life and deal with that through the exchange life. And then at the same time you're doing, doing, dealing with that, be sure to tell others about Jesus Christ. I often find the more you tell other people about Christ, the more that will change you from the inside out the more it will help you to have that reinforced that salvation is by faith alone. It is Jesus. He has changed my life. I'd like to end with this. Um, I have many different um, methods of giving out the gospel. I like using what we teach here in our, our classes, the seven steps to the plan of salvation. We give you the step. We give you the verse. We give you the verse address. And we give it to you out of Old Testament and New Testament. It takes you from the lostness to the assurance of your salvation. We're all sinners. We're condemned to death for eternity. You have to be perfect to go to heaven. Good works won't get you there. Jesus died and rose again. By faith alone in him you can have eternal life. And finally, you'll never lose your salvation. It is yours forever and ever by faith alone in Jesus Christ. That's the seven steps. Another one I like is called the good news, bad news, which we'll be teaching here in just about another month. I like that. This is the bad news, but here's the good news. This is the bad news, here's the good news. How you can have eternal life. Some of you know the Romans road. I love the Romans road because you stay in the book of Romans and you explain to a person it's not by works, but it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. I like that. However, here's what you have to be very careful of. You have to be careful that you're not presenting to a lost person merely the plan of salvation, but you're presenting the person of salvation. The relationship isn't in the plan, it is in the person. Salvation isn't in the plan, it's in the person. Now some of you are saying, yeah, preach on and throw all these methods away. No, 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 no. Sometimes it's good to have a little plan because it keeps you on the road so you don't chase all these spiritual bunny rabbits all over your conversation you're able to stay in one area. But it's not just about, I got, if, if I don't do these seven steps, if I don't do the good news, bad news, if I don't do the Romans road, I really didn't give the gospel. I don't know that that's entirely true. How do I get that? You'll notice that sometimes with one person, he's going to take care of the spiritual before he does the healing. Other times he takes care of the healing before he takes care of the spiritual. But it's all found in the person of Jesus Christ. And those of you that are listening now on radio or maybe on the internet and maybe new here today, everything that I said, I want you to know your changed life is going to happen when you believe that Jesus Christ died, he rose again, and you realize no good deed you do yourself will ever get God's grace given to you, that you are hopelessly lost. But Jesus Christ, who is rich in mercy and grace, came into your life to bring you that message of salvation by grace alone. And now you will embrace it by taking your faith, as little as it might be, and placing it in Jesus Christ. When you do that, you're instantly born again. Now, if you want to live that new life in him, you live it by the Son of God who lives his life out through you to have that consistent change life. Don't go back to the law and legalism. Spend your time worshiping him, focusing on him. Make sure you deal with those little foxes that's going to spoil your vine, those sins. And tell others about Christ. It will reinforce it. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. I'd like for you to maybe have your own encounter. For Chuck Colson, it was right before he went to prison. For you, it might be right before you leave this building. 
But I pray that you will do what Jesus said is the only way to have eternal life. Chuck was born again because he believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior. God gave him eternal life and he will never perish. And he now has eternal life and he's living that eternal life in heaven. That's the same and only message for you to have eternal life. Would you trust Christ? Chuck's life changed by the power of the Holy Spirit and because someone came alongside him to teach him sound Bible teaching. And through that he learned how important it was to discard legalism. And he would know. He was a trained attorney who could practice law in Washington, D.C., Massachusetts, Virginia. He knew the law. But he embraced grace. He was one who worshipped the Lord. He loved him with all of his heart, soul, and mind. And he knew the Christian biblical worldview. And for the rest of his life, from 1973 until he passed away this year, he told all he could that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father but through him. But that's Chuck's story. This is a similar story to this paralytic man that we've read about. Now, would this be your story? Can you say, I once was lost? But Jesus came into my life when I heard the message of salvation where I recognized him there and that it was by faith alone and I have trusted Christ. You are transformed by the imperishable word of God. The Holy Spirit has changed you. The greatest work isn't going to be that you could speak in another language. The greatest work of the Holy Spirit is going to be that he heals you from some disease. The greatest work of the Holy Spirit is he takes your dead, dead soul and spirit and gives to you eternal life by faith alone. Would you embrace that? Is there anyone here today that would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Today is my day, like that paralytic man where Jesus said to me, get up and walk. I am taking my first step of faith of believing that Christ died and rose again. If you would like me to pray for you, I'd like you to slip up your hand and by that silent hand, I'll know that you're trusting Christ and I will pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I won't have you come forward. I'm not going to mention your name in my prayer, but I do want to just welcome you into God's family and pray for you. Is there anyone here today that would let me know by an uplifted hand that you're trusting Christ? Is there anyone at all? Put up your hand. Put it down. Anyone at all? All right, Christians, this is your opportunity to go back over this message and see how you're doing in your transformed life. Are you openly confessing Christ? Do you see contact as opportunity often? Are there some sins that the Holy Spirit is revealing to you? Some sins of omission, things you're not doing you should, sins of commission, sins that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing? Do you really worship Him and you realize everything you do is for His glory? Do you? I pray so. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you loved us so much that you not only paid for our our sin debt, But that, Father, you loved us enough to bring to us the message of salvation by faith alone. You loved us enough so that, Father, we would be convicted by our need for you so that we would trust you as our Savior. We thank you enough that you sealed us forever, that we're in your forever family. We thank you that you'll never leave us and that, Father, that you are transforming us day by day. And so, Lord, help us now to reject the legalism And that, Father, as we follow lists, that we'll still keep our concentration on what's the real meat behind that principle. Because some of this practical help is good. But that's not where the power is. It's the power is behind the word of God, behind that practical help. So help us to keep it in the proper perspective. Help us to worship you, Father, and to love you. And not just worship doctrine and theology and orthodoxy. That we realize that we can worship you in spirit, true, but also in truth. And then, Father, help us to see sin. And by your power, allow you to begin to pluck those sinful ways out of our life and change it and to help us to live holy. And then finally, Lord, let us be faithful at sharing you with others. Yes, we might use different plans of salvation as long as it's by faith alone. Sometimes that's helpful, but help us to remember we are helping them to know not just a plan, but the very person behind that plan, which is you who love them 
and died for them. So, Father, we love you now. In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Oh, 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 oh,